Night Squail. Konnichiwa. Annyeong haseyo. Hello, my name is Jesse Birch. I'm the curator of Nanaimo Art Gallery. I want to start by expressing my gratitude to the Nanaimo people whose territory we are on currently. Hi Sepka Nanaimo. Snaimo people have stewarded this land since time immemorial, and it's a beautiful day to be here with you all today. Um, I also want to recognize the Japanese Canadian community who's also been here for many, many years populating these shorelines. Arigato gozaimashita. Arigato gozaimasu. And um, also, I want to just uh, acknowledge Art Action Earwig for their wonderful exhibition that's on at the Nanaimo Art Gallery currently. Uh, please check it out. Um, and I think now I'm just going to pass the mic on to Art Action Earwig. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much, Jesse, for uh, hosting us. So we're Art Action Earwig. I'm Mina Lee. And um, yeah, speaking of the land and Sunanaimo people, um, hi, Chuka. And uh, yeah, I wanted to kind of <laughs> follow their protocol as I'm meeting this land. Um, Mother Earth, here I'm going to introduce myself in their traditional way. So I, I was born and um, raised in South Korea. I was born in Busan. And uh, my mother was uh, born in a small town called Sachan in South Korea as well. Uh, my father actually is a Korean born in Japan, born in Osaka. And uh, yeah, his first language was actually Japanese. However, I, I do not really speak Japanese as a Korean person. And I, I just found it difficult to learn many languages. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's very interesting just thinking about like my own relationship to my own family, just how, how many uprooted communities actually in different places still with kind of distance and experience of be being uprooted and navigate that and how that kind of shapes our current relationship with one another. And just thinking about how we want to do that, how we reshape our relationships when a lot of our um, relationships are kind of violated or shaped by the state interests or things that are just beyond our control, uh, like beyond our will, and we want to kind of meet one another with good intention uh, and remember the people who are uprooted uh, on this land, uh, displaced people's experiences. So yeah, we are very grateful to uh, be here. and. Riley and Terafumi, do you want to introduce yourself a little bit as well? It, it's a pleasure to be here today. Um, 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 I'm not sure what else to say by way of introducing myself. Where but, are you from? Right, I was born uh, in Victoria, which is uh, uh, Hisanich and, and Lekonjin territory. Uh, and I've been in Nanaimo now for just over a year. Um, and right it's it's beautiful here and um uh, we're happy to to make more connections with uh with the place and the, and the community so um yeah I'm, I'm i'm happy that there's such a nice turnout today thank you very much uh my name is tadahumi tamra uh, i came from yokohama japan and i live in vancouver thank you everybody for coming here today today i'm going to i'm going to offer my poem to people that are here and also all the spirit buried in this land. So I'm going to read my poem in Japanese first and then Whitey and the Sun is going to my poem uh, read um, in English. So yeah, once again, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Riley and uh, Tarafumi. So we are our action earwig, uh, three of us. And when we uh, talked to talked about this exhibition, Give Birth, Love, Tooth, um, with Ayaka. <laughs> Actually, Ayaka uh, talked about her research. Um, and uh, because the exhibition is about kind of thinking about our family history and the land and our relationship through kind of stories about teeth 
specifically wisdom tooth um, as a metaphor, but also as a physical object and agency to kind of think about our bodily relationship to those uh, all those like family ancestry and uh, the land. And here, stone. As I was looking at the stones, um, kind of oh, they kind of look like you know, feel like teeth in the gum of Mother Earth and. I appreciated Ayaka kind of offered to us this uh, her own practice um, of visiting Japanese uh, Canadian grapes in Canada and um, I think Ayaka can give us more uh, kind of introduction about why we are gathering uh, with and beside those uh, Japanese graves at Bowen Cemetery here and these are somebody's grave and we you know didn't know about them at all but Ayaka introduced a little bit of like who they are like what their relationship might have been who their families might have been and it's been a very meaningful learning process so Ayaka will speak a little bit to that and yeah welcome <laughs> Ayaka sure you can come okay Thank you, Mina, for your kind introduction. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Ayaka Yoshimizu, and I'm, I'm a first-generation immigrant, uh, originally a settler, originally from Tokyo in Japan. Um, about 20 years ago, I moved to the lands of uh, Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh people's lands, uh, or what is colonially known as Burnaby and then Vancouver. Um, and I'm very honored and grateful today to uh, be on the land of Sunanemo people on this beautiful Mother's Day. Um, Art Action Erie kindly invited me to their project and I have been involved in the planning of this event uh, as a researcher collaborator. And we are gathering at this particular section of the cemetery to honor Japanese Canadian community which had a very vibrant presence in Nanaimo before the Second World War and then forcefully, forcefully, sorry, forcefully uprooted during the war. And Tami um, will talk more about this history shortly. And in this section of the cemetery there are many graves of Japanese uh, Canadian children who passed away before the community was displaced and we are meeting here on Mother's Day to honor and remember the children who are buried here, but also uh, honor and remember their parents who are uprooted uh, and never returned. So I'll talk more about these specific um, Japanese Canadian graves later, but for now I'd like to pass the mic back to Mina. Um, but I'd like to thank um, everybody for being here and joining us today. Thank you so much, Ayaka, for grounding us here and also creating space uh, for the spirits to join. Actually, we have some spirits joining right over there um, as well with us in the circle. I'm grateful to have you all. And um, yes, we are going to have a very special guest, uh, Tami Hirasawa, who is going to speak more about the Seven Potatoes um, Japanese Canadian Society based in Nanaimo and um, also the pre-war history and uh, more about the community. Thanks, Mina. So my name is Tami Hirasawa and I'm representing the Central Vancouver Island Japanese Canadian Society, also known as the Seven Potatoes because Nana equals seven and Imo equals potato, which is a literal translation of Nanaimo in Japanese. I'm really grateful to be here on the traditional ancestral land of the Sinemic First Nations people who are the caretakers of this land. As a Japanese Canadian person living in Nanaimo, I'm very pleased to be included in this event as we raise awareness of Japanese Canadian history here in Nanaimo. Should I just go on? Okay, so young single Japanese men came to Nanaimo in the late 1880s and not 1890s and by 1901 Nanaimo census lists 97 single men of Japanese descent and there were probably more because there were some um, transient people that kind of came and went back to Steveston and came and went back to Japan and came back to Nanaimo so there's probably more than 97 in 1901 but those men built a thriving Japanese Canadian community right here in Nanaimo. Starting in the late 1890s, there was a very successful herring salteries on Departure Bay, Jesse Island, Protection Island, Seisuchun, formerly Newcastle Island, and also along Stewart Avenue. 
The herring saltingries exported their produce to Japan and other Asian countries. But by 1920, Nanaimo had been known as herring capital of the world. Fishermen and boat builders lived and worked in these areas. Fishermen living along Stewart Avenue also fished all over Vancouver Island and up and down the coast of BC, including Deep Bay, uh, Euclid, and uh, Masaku Fukawa's father used to fish all the way up to the Skeena River. And he used Shack Island as a resting place or way station with other cod fishermen. There was also a group of Japanese Canadians living in the Brecon area with many homes, shops, businesses, all along Stewart Avenue. At the corner of Stewart and Juniper, there was a Japanese language school which was also used as a Japanese Canadian community center. The success of the industrious, hardworking Japanese Canadians gave rise to racist propaganda and racist government policies by those who believed the Japanese Canadians were a threat to Canadian industries. In 1942, at the start of World War II, uh, yeah, at the start of World War II, the entire community was forcibly removed from the West Coast when everyone of Japanese descent was uprooted, displaced, and had all their property and belongings confiscated by the Canadian government. My parents, who were born in Canada, were among the almost 22,000 people that were affected. Despite the once thriving community here in Nanaimo, there is no heritage markers or signage in the city of Nanaimo. This past two years, the Seven Potatoes has been working with the city of Nanaimo to plant Japanese cherry blossom trees in Nanaimo parks. We've already planted 26 Akabono Japanese cherry blossom trees in Bowen Park, Rockridge Park, and most recently in Bebin Park along Bowen Road. Our goal is to raise enough money to plant significantly more cherry trees in Nanaimo. The cherry blossoms are significant to the Japanese people. They bring peace and beauty to the city in the spring when they bloom, and they remind us of the fleetingness of life when the blossoms fall to the ground. And I have more information about the cherry blossom project, and Makoto in the red puppy coat has more information if anybody is interested. Um, so then, Following the uprooting of the Japanese Canadians, they were um, taken to uh, internment camps uh, forcibly in the interior of BC. And then in 1946, they were given a choice of either moving east of the Rockies or being exiled to Japan. And so this is the, and very few people came back to Nanaimo. I think there was only four people that ever were documented that actually lived here that came back to Nanaimo after 1949, they were allowed to come back. So that was four years after the end of World War II when they were allowed to come back to the coast. So that's the story of the Japanese Canadians in uh, Nanaimo. And I'm gonna hand it over to Tadafumi, I think. Is that right? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Um, so, okay, Tarafumi can help me, probably. Our poem will come a little bit later, but um, Tarafumi, would you actually like the unreveal the uh, offerings for our oh, yeah. grapes? So, we, we, we've got a little bit of um, humble offerings. So, um, when we were thinking about this event we thought about oh okay should we do like a japanese traditional offerings and various thoughts we kind of like wandered around but uh, eventually we wanted to have something that's humble that's uh, kind of more open creative so that everyone can also uh, consume what is offered to the the spirits um we share the space i think it's more of it might be more of a korean tradition kind of we offer food to the dead but then we consume after the offering and uh, the small ceremony so um the uh, japanese too okay okay excellent so Chinese do too. Yeah, so it's something, there's something universal about it. Um, and yeah, so a uh, little offerings for them and we're going to let you know what those stones are about later. Um, 
So yeah, we're gonna uh, invite Ayaka back to the space to um, actually uh, guide us to meet some individual uh, graves so that we get to know them better. So it's very unusual. <laughs> yeah, true enough. Very unusual for us to kind of visit graves that are not our family members and not our direct ancestors. But we wanted to create a, in a way, like sense of bigger, bigger sense of family. <laughs> so we're all children of Mother Earth. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, can uh, so I have been doing research about transnational migration to and from Japan. And recently, I be began to study various forms of me memorial um, that are meant to commemorate the people, particularly of Japanese ancestry, who were engaged in very precarious labor, uh, who survived and died in the transnational spaces. And I spent a lot of time in cemeteries. Um, so I talk a little bit about Japanese Canadian graves in BC broadly, and more a little bit more about Japanese Canadian graves here based on my research. But before that, I introduced this notion of grievability. grievability. Um, so we grieve or we mourn the loss of the family members, friends, somebody close to you, maybe your pets. Um, and in Japanese, we say itamu. Ita itamu means to grieve or to mourn. And the word itami also means um, that to ache. So the idea of grievability suggests that some death are more grievable than others. And this also means that some death are less grievable because their lives are deemed less worthy than others in the dominant perception of the given society. And as I do my research about and in cemeteries in Canada, I started to learn more about how this grievability is materialized or expressed uh, in cemetery. So I started to notice that um, you know, graves that belong to minoritized peoples, like, uh, such as indigenous peoples, racialized groups, women, religious minorities, people of low, lower class, lower status, and disabled people are often marginalized in cemeteries, segregated and litigated um, to the farthest corner or the edge um, of the cemetery, uh, given smaller burial spaces, neglected to the point where they are eroded from the landscape, often are marked and identified only by their ethnicity in very you know, derogatory manner, in video records, um, so on and so forth. And unmarked graves of, of course, indigenous children at the former site of uh, in indigenous residential school, Indian residential schools are the you know, most horrific example of this. In terms of Japanese graves uh, from pre-war period, in BC, I, ha I have found that they are usually clustered together if they are multiple, pushed to the extreme periphery, isolated, and sometimes unmarked. And in, Mount in Mount View Cemetery in Vancouver, Chinese, Japanese, and Jewish sections are segregated from the rest. Uh, the Japanese section together with Chinese and Jewish sections are located along the Fraser Street, right by the busy road. There's another Mountain View Cemetery in Duncan on this island. If you go to the north side of the cemetery, you get a gorgeous view of mountains indeed. Uh, but Japanese section is located at the opposite end uh, along the south border. So no mountain views from that section of the cemetery. In Ross Bay Cemetery in Victoria, Japanese Chinese and indigenous graves were washed away in the winter storm of 1909 because they are located along the seawall border. In Japanese cemetery in Cumberland, Japanese graves are vandalized in the 1940s in the context of war. Um, and Jodo Shinshu, a Buddhist temple in Stevenson, created a very beautiful memorial um, out of the scattered headstones. So now if you go there, you can see that new memorial. And it was built in 1967. So when you look around, uh, what do you notice about the location of Japanese Canadian graves? So you can, you know, hear the sound, you can, you know, orient yourself within the cemetery. You can see the view, what you see around you. So just, just pause a little bit. So in this cemetery, I have found uh, eight Japanese graves, meaning there are eight markers with Japanese names on them. 
So let me read out the names of those individuals in, in the order of family name and given name. Um, Teranishi Yoshiharu, Tanino Hiroshi, Hamanishi Itsuko, Koyama Kazuyo, Konishi Matsutaro, Maruno Hayato, Yoshida Yoichi, Shibata Kimie. And uh, you can find them. Uh, so we place flowers in front of these graves. So if you're interested, uh, please visit them and look at the markers. Um, and among these eight graves, three are babies. And they're also a 12 years old uh, child. Um, there's one adult who is 66 years old. And the ages of the remaining three are unknown. But it's noteworthy that at least four among eight of them are either babies or child. Uh, I was able to find death registrations of two, two individuals buried here. Both of them died by accidental drowning. Further archival research showed me that many of the family members were deported back to Japan in 1946 after being interned in internment camps during the war. And as Tami spoke earlier, very few people return to Nanaimo, so it's very safe to assume that most of these graves do not have families or friends who come visit or take after and look after these, these graves. And in Japanese, these graves are called Muenbotoke, uh, literally spirits without family ties or the disease, the deceased without relationships. And in Japanese Buddhist tradition, this is something you know. Uh, that shouldn't happen, happen to you. It's the saddest thing that, you, that could happen to you, right? Dying without having any family or friends looking after your grave. So I'm going to draw your attention to two graves. I don't know if we, it's, it's very hot. So maybe, maybe I'm gonna... Maybe we can do a little bit of kind of slow walk and then pause at the grave and then kind of come back. Yeah, Something maybe like uh, then after this, yeah. <laughs> That Before, too. how do you feel like you want to visit to these two graves? Ayaka is sharing story a little bit briefly and then come back and hear the story. Yeah, yeah. Will that be okay? Let's briefly okay. visit. All right. Be, be careful. You know, where about the graves around? This so, uh, I want to talk a little bit about Tanino Hiroshi or Hiroshi Tanino here. Uh, he was born in 1918. He passed away in 1929, he was 12 years old. And according to his death record, his mother's name is Kawasaki Chio, father's name is Tanino Mansuke, and he died from accidental drowning. And when he passed away, the family was living in Brekin, but it seems that they had just moved from other part of BC to Brekin one year before his death. And other archival records show that he had four sisters but all of them were born after Hiroshi's death. Um, the family was forcibly uprooted to Lemon Creek slogan during the war and were exiled to Japan in 1946. So I only have a limited amount of information about each of these people. So that, that was uh, something I know about Hiroshi. And then um, I want you to come over. You see uh, the grave of Teranishi Yoshiharu. So I know that Tami, you did a little bit of research about this family and knows a little bit more about this family and the death of this baby. Uh, so you might be able to hear more about um, this family from her later. What I want to share with you now is the engraving, engraving on this marker. So you, as you can see, it says Teranishi in memory of baby Yoshiharu. So um, you know, Yoshiharu was a baby, um, and as you can see, these are all written in English. Then there are two poems, and these are written in Japanese. And on the right hand side, in the right poem, it says Teranishi Yoshiharu, his name in Japanese, in kanji, Chinese characters. And in the left column, it says Senzo Dai Dai no Haka, which means ancestral graves or intergenerational graves. And I was struck by this phrase, intergenerational graves. This is actually a very common phrase that you see in Japanese headstones. But the assumption is that there are generations of the family buried you know, in the same 
spot or you know maybe the older members of the family are very there and the younger generation will join them later so when i first read this phrase on this marker dedicated to the baby it was very striking so upon some reflection i thought that maybe this is an expression of the parents uh you know and their wish to join the baby when the time comes which didn't happen because they are brooded uh, in exile to japan so that i don't should we yeah. go back yeah and if you're interested in other grapes uh please come talk to me after so uh the name of this event is b hyphen membering families futures and hurts and when we were brainstorming the idea for this title, I contributed the word uh, futures, being inspired by uh, the baby Yoshihalu's uh, marker and that graving, uh, you know, intergenerational graves. So by remembering Japanese Canadians who are buried in this cemetery, we want to create a space where the spirits of the families are reunited, so re-membered, and think of the present as the future of the past when Teranishi's wish to be reunited with a baby, Yoshiharu. And I, I said earlier that I have found eight Japanese markers in this cemetery, but it's very, very possible, and in fact, very safe to assume that there are more people, Japanese and other people who are minoritized based on their race, religion, class, occupation, so on, buried somewhere in, in this cemetery, but without having any markers that you know tell us the locations of their burial sites. So when we honor Japanese Canadians who are buried underneath these markers, I, I'd like to expand our imagination and extend our respect to others who are buried, um, um, you know, here, but, you know, their graves are marked, made invisible and less grievable. So I'll pass this mic to Mina again. Thank you so much. Um, um, Tami, would you like to speak a little bit more about Ternishi, a grave that you, you, you've, you've found a little bit more about the family all right i can just briefly say that i did a search on the landscapes of injustice website uh, which is a, a project out of the university of victoria and so i put in the taranishi last name and it popped up with this um, baby's parents and so when you search through that um, that case file they talk about they lived at 12 I can't remember the exact address, but they give the exact address on Stewart Avenue where they lived, and that after they were uprooted and forced to go to Lemon Creek, all of the contents were ransacked and um, looted, and then their fishing boat, the, the father was a fisherman, and so the fishing boat was sold at auction, and the there's letters back and forth talking from the custodian of enemy alien property with the Taranishi family saying we want your we want your title to the boat because we just sold it at auction without your knowledge and they're going well we don't have the title and so um, it turns out that the boat was given to them by the mother's father and so there was no record that that was sold and so the the father actually still had the title but it was sold for four hundred dollars and then there was auction fees and all kinds of other stuff and so there, it, it was a very sad story. But then in one letter that the mother writes back to the custodian, she says, well, we went into debt. We have no money because we had to spend all this money on the burial of my baby. And so she talks about this happening in 1938 and it still affected the family at that time. So it was very interesting to go through that, that case file. And you can, these are all public records that you can go through and look and see uh, it's this is not an isolated incident like all of the Japanese Canadians had all of their uh, property and belongings confiscated in the same same manner Thanks. Okay. thank you so much Tammy and um, yeah this is only little bit of uh, information we can actually access and see and when we imagine like uh, Ayaka talking about unmarked graves and stories that that will be associated with those unmarked uh, graves will be you know it's just kind of unimaginable but we want to kind of also imagine try to um, imagine that so thank you so much for sharing those knowledge and 
Yeah, we are going to have a very special moment to have Tara Fumi here to share、um, Tara Fumi's his,、uh, poem in Japanese.、Yeah. ボヒョウとボヒョウの間に立って祈る大切な人の墓を残してこの土地を追われた人のために墓標のない墓にいた子供たちが教えてくれたのは見たいものしか見ていないということ赤いドレスを着た女性が教えてくれたのは聞きたい言葉しか聞いていないということ。沈黙に耳を傾ける。その言葉は記録されていないから。不在に目を凝らす。その存在は認識されていないから。不在に目を凝らし。沈黙に耳を傾ける I stand and pray between the gravestones for the people uprooted. Had to leave their loved ones' graves behind them. The children buried in unmarked graves taught me that I am seeing what I think I can see. Women wearing red dresses told me. I am seeing what I think I can see. I am here to listen carefully to the silence, the voices unrecorded. I am here to look hard at the absences, their presence unrecognized. Look hard at the absences. Listen carefully to the silences. I stand and pray between the gravestones for the people uprooted, had to leave their loved ones' graves behind them. Thank you so much, Tarafumi and、uh, Riley. And、um, yeah, it made me think about a lot of things, and also it makes me think about、um, actually appreciating and、um, also invite you to look at those hearts made by Deirdre Pinock,、um, who is our collaborator, who's also, whose work is featured in our exhibition. Um, Deirdre is a fiber artist, a black woman who is very active,、uh, mental health advocate, and also a Yan bomber who、uh, puts a lot of hearts in the downtown east side and、um, also、uh, all over the Vancouver. And today I noticed she's busy、uh, actually putting up those hearts on wire fences in Vancouver to express、uh, her, her love for mothers. <laughs> So, yeah, I want to also remember that, you know, all those、um, folks who are houseless,、uh, suffering from mental、um, health issues and challenges, and also、um, missing and murdered women and girls and two spirit folks, because、uh, earlier this month there was Red Dress Day,、um, and we want to ex- extend our hearts to those and spirits and their families and friends. 
Yeah, and we have very special ceremony or Zoyaka and Tarafumi prepared for you to participate if you want, so let's go for it. So um, I have collected 30 to 40 uh, pebbles, rocks, and uh, shells, and they are from Departure Bay, which, which is very close to where Japanese settlements were located before the Second World War. Um, and the Departure Bay was also one of the Sunanemo sites that we uh, visited under the guidance of Dave Bodley. Yeah, Dave Bodley. Yeah, the Sunanemo cultural interpreter. And he explained to us that the spirit portal standing at the north end of the Departure Bay actually invites, and it's facing toward the ocean, and it invites spirits, you know, from the ocean to the land. So um, the Departure Bay was selected for the location uh, of you know to, to collect these pebbles for several reasons and we are going to return them back to the departure bay after the event is over so i'd like you to select uh one or two um pebbles or shells from these buckets um i mean the baskets and please select something that you like and it's important that you select the you know the, the shell or the pebbles that you like and when, once you know which ones you like, please place them anywhere between graves, uh, between these markers. So the idea is that we collectively create temporary markers um, to remember, honor, and respect the death of Japanese Canadian or otherwise that have been made less or not grievable. And so I'm hoping that these markers will guide the spirits from the other side of the Pacific Ocean to come over to join their family members um, as well. So there are two baskets. Um, one is gone. I've got one. Oh, great. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. And it's anywhere you like. You can place them anywhere you like. Yeah, thank you um, Ayaka and Tarafumi and everyone for doing that. It was just so, um, yeah, kind of heartfelt to, good to have a moment to actually hold the stone and then um, put it onto the ground and look at those graves more closely. Um, yeah, I mean, coincidentally, actually, we talked to different, our different collaborators and contributors and uh, Lisa at uh, Raisin Virgin, who wrote a uh, writing for our exhibition, actually talks deeply about stones and how stones are our uh, ancestors. So yeah, don't miss the, her writing in the <laughs> brochure, exhibition brochure. And yeah, I, I love how it creates like intercultural conversations, like very different, but very deeply connected. Um, so yeah, thank you so much. Very much appreciated. Okay, and now we've done our ceremony, so it's time for us to consume. <laughs> so we're going to offer it back to your table so you can enjoy them. Um, and yeah, feel free, be our guests. Thank you so much for being here.